Oh, hey. Hey, how are you? Hey, Colleen, Chris Anderson, where are you? I am in Pitlockery, Scotland. Oh. Yes. And where are you? Oh, you're in Chicago. I am here in the great state of Illinois and in the fine city of Chicago. Um, welcome everybody to History Happy Hour, brought to you with the help of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours, which does what, Chris? Um, tours. And where are they? Around the world. Oh, yeah, Europe, Europe hey, U.S., hey. and Pacific. Oh, yeah. Check it out, StephenAmbroseTours.com. And uh, whether you're watching live, watching on replay, or listening on the HHH very good. Thank you for joining us. And today we're going to be talking about General George Patton. So do let us know you're here and what you're drinking. We do have a number of people who've already joined and are putting their comments all down. And Chris, we should say thank you to everybody who supports us via Patreon, Absolutely. especially our top shelf patrons. And we got a new one this week. I haven't had a chance to add uh -huh. her to the list, but I will have her on uh, the next time we do a show. You can help keep the History Taps running by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash history happy hour. Who's out there, Chris? Anybody? Yeah, we have uh, Frank mm -hmm. Cook from uh, Southeastern Mass. And we have uh, Lizzie Borden and Little Lizzie. So that was, that was good. Uh, Ted Moon from uh, the Eisenhower Memorial. Um, Mark Dispenza from uh, Baton Rouge. And we actually, I, I want to scroll back up. We had somebody who's already asking our guest questions, even though we haven't introduced them. He's, he's kind of, Arrow owner is asking questions of our guests before we even. All right. Yeah, we don't, we don't, we, we, we haven't, <laughs> we'll have to scroll yeah. back up to find those questions. Right. Um, so uh, uh, do you think we've killed enough time? Or I should think, we, kill, I, we should kill some more time? You know, I just came back from vacation. Did you, Rick? Are you going to show I did. Your, Don't your I look vacation pictures? Tanned? Oh, I, we, we have hundreds of them. I, I just oh, felt good. I didn't have the time. Uh, um, it was in uh, British Columbia. Oh, uh, um, Canada. Victoria. And Whistler up in the mountains. And um, Vancouver. Great city, ah, Vancouver. Sounds like a good trip. It was a lovely trip. We got back last night, and I'm I'm just refreshed and ready to you know spring on Kevin Hemel and ask him many yeah. you know charged up questions. You, so. you finally decided to join the show again, as always. <laughs> After mailing it in <laughs> for the last two weeks. Yeah. All right. Let's let's get this thing underway. Yeah. So let's. So you have to give me oh, a cue. Oh, right. I, I, I was getting the fingers ready. It's, it's been a couple of weeks. <laughs> Boom. is open the bar is open and you know before we get started today chris uh, i want to mention uh, that a long time history happy hour viewer uh recently passed away uh ward skip cornett passed away on july 2nd at age 75 and i'm sure that many of our viewers have seen skip's comments and questions during shows Absolutely. he frequently reached out to us with show suggestions some of which we're still working on and one thing he never mentioned in all those emails is that he was diagnosed with ALS last summer. Um, we found out about his passing when his wife Becky emailed us to let us know. Uh, and Skip was a Lutheran minister. Uh, he was also a Coast Guard veteran. And his cremated remains will be buried at sea by the Coast Guard if they haven't been already. Uh, I met Skip and Becky at the 75th D-Day anniversary when I was helping out with their tour group for a few days. And, uh, and so, um, you know, I want to... As I'm sure you do, I want to express my condolences to Absolutely. Becky and his daughter, Andrea. I want to thank him for her service and offer condolences to his family and know that he will be missed. And we really appreciated his involvement in the show and we'll remember. Yeah, and we are so sorry to lose a, 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 an enthusiastic uh, member really up until the last few weeks, an enthusiastic member of the HHH family. Absolutely. So our guest today... Yes. Is needs no fellow, introduction. <laughs> as, uh, needs no introduction, but he will get one anyway. Yeah, it's okay. Is a fellow Stephen Ambrose Tours historian who both Chris and I know quite well. Kevin Hemel has written the second volume of his Patton trilogy, Patton's War and American General's Combat Leadership. And Kevin has served as an historian for the U.S. Army and Air Force. Uh, he is also, in addition to the Patton series, the author of Patton's Photographs, War as He Saw It. He was also the research director for World War II History and Military Heritage magazines. He leads the In Patton's Footsteps, Ambrose Historical Tours, Tour, 
has appeared in numerous documentaries. Kevin Hema, welcome back to History Happy Hour. Good to see you guys. How you both doing? Doing well. And you, you're looking like you're on vacation too. Is everybody yes, on I'm quite relaxed today. I'm actually at my buddy's place in Rehoboth Beach. Mm -hmm. um, his daughters are off to school and whatnot. So I'm taking a little downtime uh, to work on volume three and uh, just enjoying the sun out here. And uh, I've got my Hawaiian shirt. I, I'm sorry, my tropical shirt that I yes. purchased in Guam uh, yes. from the last time we were on tour together, Chris. So things are good. Good. So, so, so Rehoboth Beach is in what part of the country? It is in Delaware. In Delaware, okay, yes. the great state of Delaware. Oh, 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 great state! We were talking was, about this before. You were being. <laughs> yeah, I was a little was down like, on Delaware before, but now, just context. in case we have, we might have some Delaware viewers. Oh, so, okay. right. did, and you did know what's you... kind of cool about Delaware? Uh, cool. They've got a number of World War II watchtowers yeah. where they would look out for German U-boats, and the the water around here was mined during the uh, mid 1940s. And they've turned one of the bunkers into a museum and they've got, you know, six inch guns and 105s and everything out there. You can start working and on the Delaware the tour. Yeah. Yep. It's for, it's pretty impressive, I got to say. Nice. Oh. So did you bring a cocktail today, Kevin? I have on hand a 1664 beer, my favorite beer in all of France. Oh, boy, that's a pretty... <laughs> Never mind. Oh, okay. yeah. I think that's a whole other show. If we're yeah, going to get into French other beers, other let's other save other. that for our Thanksgiving show. I, I, I thought maybe. You, Patton or 1664 beer? I thought oh, maybe boy, you would have a an, really hard one. <laughs> yeah. an, an armored diesel. An armored diesel. That's an old Patton drink. Yeah, that's what I figured wow. you would have that. And I wanted to know how similar the armored diesel was to a drink that I know. That, that Bradley served at his headquarters in Luxembourg, which was British gin, vermouth liberated from the Wehrmacht, and lemon powder from the K-ration anti-scurvy packet. Oh, that's what... Well, oh. Bradley took a lot of credit for things Patton did, so he probably copied off of him. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> um, Chris, yeah, Ernie Pyle just team. made up... Ernie Pyle just made up that story about Bradley. Oh, uh, okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Kevin, your new book covers Patton from August 1st to December 26th, I guess, or 27th, 1944, uh, from the time he took over the Third Army to the relief of Bastogne. I did a quick calculation. I think it's 147 days. Uh, and and the book is like 350 pages, so that's like 2.4 pages per day. Um, mm -hmm. and so it's basically like a day-to-day -day running account of this period. And was that your goal, was to basically try to capture just what George Patton was doing every day during this this most tumultuous and and, and busy time of the uh, of the of the war. Um, not initially, but as I did the writing, I realized that's the only way to really play it out because a lot of my predecessors and other historians they'll skip over certain parts uh, because they want to highlight one battle or the other. And I found that if you really want to understand him and his leadership principles, there's enough information to do a day by day. And I just I really wanted to cover as much as I could of his life and his leadership in World War II. And that's really what it, you know, the way it kind of fell together, especially because I had his original handwritten diaries. I had so many letters he had written and so many veteran interviews that, I mean, he almost, he's on the front every day talking to a different soldier. Um, and in a lot of ways, the, the story kind of wrote itself. So, so what, um, to kind of pick up where we left off last time, what what's Patton been doing since volume one, you know, before we jump right into the weeds, but what's, what's. Yeah. So volume one covers him to when he steps foot basically onto the Moroccan shores on November 8th, 1942, uh, covers him, you know, fighting in Tunisia and Sicily going finally up to, well, you know, living in isolation for a while down in Sicily, then transferring to England uh, and training up third army and then finally getting to France, waiting for, you know, Third Army to become active. So there was a lot of downtime in Volume 1. Uh, volume 2, which, you know, as you mentioned, is basically August 1st when Third Army becomes active, all the way to December 31st. He is in constant action the whole time. There's no downtime for him. Um, and it's really just a microscope onto his day-to-day -day actions as Third Army commander. Okay. So, Kevin, uh, before we get into the substance of the book, something that you, you actually started writing about at the very beginning, and then, you know, so I, it's 
first thing I read, so it's my first question. Um, uh, a primary source for anybody writing about General Patton is his substantial personal diary. And in between your work on volume one and your work on volume two, you made a discovery about the diary that you call history altering. So what was that discovery and how did it affect your working on this book? So basically just about anyone who's written about Patton since 1953 has relied on his typed diary, his typed up diary. So his wife, with the help of two officers from his staff, uh, typed up his diaries, you know, and then she was kind of honest about it. She said his handwriting was really poor. And so this was to, to help historians out. And so everybody, Martin Blumenson, when he did the patent papers, uh, Carlo Deste, um, Laddius F uh, Farago, all of them have relied on these typed up diaries. So when I was writing my book, I got to the part where he predicts the Battle of the Bulge, and I was a little uncomfortable with that. And so I asked the Library of Congress staff, we were just coming out of the pandemic. And I said, you know, can I see the handwritten ones? And they said, actually, they're online with word for word translations, you know. So they brought up the page for me. And the line where he predicts the Battle of the Bulge was not there. And that's when I realized I really was on to something. And they had really transcribed just about all the diaries up to that point. <clears throat> so I had to go back to the very beginning of volume two and go through the whole thing, comparing the handwritten and the transcribed diaries. And I realized a lot of things he said he thought he didn't think, a lot of opinions he gave he didn't give, and a lot of predictions he made he did not make. And so it really was, I realized that this, what I was looking at was a sanitized version of Patton, like so many of my predecessors and myself in my previous writings. And I knew that I had to get it right. I, I couldn't ignore this resource. And, you know, I've been prepared for a lot of people to be mad at me because he's much more racist, um, much less uh, clairvoyant and not the great judge of other people's skills and abilities that we think he is. He, you know, that you read those diaries and letters and you just think, boy, this guy just gets everything and everyone else is kind of flailing. You read so, the original. So yeah, so, so let, let, let me jump in with an example, but sure. well, we have two of them, but I'll start with this one. Uh, so this is a page from August 7th or August 8th, uh, 19, uh, I guess August 7th, 1944, and where the little arrow is there, if you can see that, uh, he says that uh, Generals Lee, Plank, and Hughes called, and that's all he says in the diary. Right. But what you write in the book that, that the typed diary says includes a whole paragraph after that. As usual, Lee was in a great hurry to do nothing uh, and covered with smiles. I have seldom seen a man less suited for his job. Someone described him very aptly the other day. He is a pompous little son of a bitch, only interested in self-advertisement. So that whole thing that I just read was added by somebody else, either either Mrs. Patton or one of the two officers who, who went over this with her. Right. Paul Harkins and Hap Gay helped her put this together. So what I kind of concluded is this was a lot of score selling, uh, settling for the staff and even his wife. And so, and that's, you find that going through comparing the two diaries, entire paragraphs that didn't exist. And I was very tempted to correct the record, you know, say, hey, it says this, but not here. But I realized that's not the point of my book. My point of my book is to tell the narrative truthfully. And so I tackled some of it in the end notes. But for the majority, I just went with what I saw. Um, yeah. And, and people base a lot of opinions on Lee on that paragraph. Um, and it's just it just didn't exist. It wasn't the truth. There's another incident. I think I sent you the page from the transcribe, oh, please, yeah. can you, please, can you bring that up? There it is. So if you look at the top paragraph, this is, if you look at the very top, November 25th, 1944, and you'll see that underlined part where he says, you know, Bradley's making a mistake uh, by leaving the eighth corps, that's Middleton, static. And then he says, it's highly probable the Germans are building up uh, west of, or east of him. And then you see there's a number one at the end, and you follow that one to the bottom of the page. And it says it was against Eighth Corps that von Rundstedt, you know, had his offensive 21 days later. So not only is there a prediction there, if any historian is dumb enough to miss it, they put a footnote so you could follow it. So it's basically just hand, you know, handed on a silver platter to anybody reading it. <clears throat> so again, going to his handwritten diaries, that sentence is not there. The sentence does exist. 
but it exists on December 27th, 1944. So, you know, oh, slightly been, different situation. Exactly. Uh, Patton has turned his army north. He's gone up to Bastogne. It's the day after the relief of Bastogne that he writes this and he's reflecting and he just says, Bradley shouldn't have left that core very passive, you know, and it was sort of an, a, 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 he did a lot of unfair criticism of other people that he just wasn't aware of their situation. And so he's criticizing Middleton after the fact. So his wife took that sentence, moved it back to November 25th. So it looks like he's predicting the bulge. So, so given that, uh, because you know, just those two, the example you show that that's not a slight edit. That's a complete revision of the historical of record, and, and that's one of the things he's best known for. It's in the movie, right? You know? Right. Yeah. So, 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 how does this all affect um, our impression of Patton? Right? Is 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 our perception of Patton then totally wrong, or is? Um... Well, no, because once he finally got involved in the battle, he performed, I think, brilliantly. Right. Um, but he was human. He didn't think it was possible for the Germans to launch this attack. In fact, when the attack does come and Bradley takes 10th Armor away from him, um, he says, you know, Troy Middleton's getting pummeled. It's bad. And Patton's like, oh, they're all overreacting. So instead of sending the 10th Armored up, he calls Walton Walker, whose core is the most northern core of his army. And he says, check with Middleton, because I think everybody's overreacting. And it's not until a couple, you know, 20 minutes later that Walker calls him back, says, no, it's worse than what people are saying. Um, in fact, Patton turns his fourth armored and six armored. He doesn't want them getting caught up in the bulge. So he actually sends them uh, yeah. southeast to get away from it. Um, so, you know, once you realize he did not predict the bulge, all of his actions make a lot more sense. Because, like, if he's predicting it, why is he running away from it? Why is he doubting it? You know, if he's really predicting it, he'd be much more ready. Um, but he's a human being like all of us. You know, he, his, he was getting daily intelligence reports saying the enemy is not strong enough for a major offensive. They could do something locally. And, you know, but that's another thing that, uh, unfortunately, my predecessor, Martin Blumenson, talked about is that his uh, intelligence officer, um, oh, shoot, his name Coke? is... Coke? Coke? Cook, yes. Um tells him at one point, oh, my God, they're building up in Trier. And this is the big evidence of the bulge. Well, Patton says, well, what does it mean? And they go, we don't know. So when you look through this lens that he's not predicting it, the gray area makes more sense. You know, and, and you know, the, everybody puts a lot of weight into this, you know, us, I'm sorry, Oscar Koch, that Koch is predicting it. But you look, if you go to the actual intelligence reports that Patton is looking at every day, they're like, 26 pages long each. And generals don't read every page. They go to the summary at the very end. And in the summary, every day from November 25th to December 16th, they said the enemy is incapable of major attacks. They can do something local. There was nothing in those intelligence reports saying that there was a big attack coming. So, so uh, I'm sorry. I, I guess I'm jumping in here. No, no, so, I think uh, it's... Are, <laughs> you go ahead. Jump. Are these, John. are these, I mean, is there any validity then to any of Patton's diaries or, or is this all just, I mean, you were citing the most famous example, but if this is, is this endemic and in, in, in what we know about Patton and, and. Yes. I hate to put it like boldly like that, but all the significant events, his wife embellished his diaries. Um, I think one of the big ones is, uh, who is it? Um, Sandy Patch crosses, goes to the Rhine River, famously, I think it was in October, and Eisenhower tells him not to go any further. Right. And there's a whole paragraph in the diaries, Patton saying, you know, he, Sandy's right, we should let him do this and that. And it's just not there in the diaries. You know, he says something like, Sandy Patch should be allowed to maneuver as he wants. You know, something like that. Not, if we don't cross the Rhine, it's a catastrophe, blah, blah, blah. Right. Some of the stuff is correct word for word. But I did. I found a different Patton going back to those original diaries, and at least now we know, you know. And I was concerned because of the racism and anti-Semitism and the lack of predicting the bulge that I was denigrating him. But a lot of people who read the book said, "No, no, you know, he still comes out as a very good general, even though you've changed a lot of the wrinkles in his story." So, you know, he still comes out as a master of the battlefield, but just not in a godlike way that a lot of people put him to be. 
So this is all music to Chris Anderson's ears. <laughs> I, I, I'm not saying a word, actually. Uh, he's got to be happy that I'm the one telling that story. Yeah, like, God, yeah. I know. It's work. like double. It's like double. <laughs> you sure so, you want to do another volume? <laughs> I want I want to hear about volume four because that's oh, the one that shy. sounds really well. That's when uh, the ghost of Patton comes back. Oh, okay. The reincarnate. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so um, there are kind of four generals who always seem to come up at the heart of the World War II story in Europe, even though there are many other generals there: uh, Eisenhower, Bradley, Montgomery, and Patton. And so, what did Patton bring to the battlefield that the others didn't? Uh, and Kevin, was he as down on them as all of them as sometimes the quotes from his now questionable uh, diary sometimes make it appear? Um, okay, so the first question is, what did he bring to the battlefield? And I <clears> that think the others didn't, right? That he brought risk taking to the battlefield. He took risks um, that could have gone wrong, but they went right. The big one, you know, people credit the Battle of the Bulge as Patton's greatest moment. I disagree with that. I really think his greatest moment was the race across France because everything had been done with infantry, uh, you know, following kind of the rules of, of Fort Leavenworth, things like that. And he kind of rewrites the playbook and just says, I'm not going to worry about my flanks. I, I believe that if you attack the enemy in one area and you break through, you just keep going because they're so busy reeling from that. They won't have time to attack your flanks. And basically what he does is he takes his, tactical air support and says, you guys are going to protect my flanks. That had never been done before. And it worked. It worked incredibly well. Um, so I think that's what he brought to the battlefield, that sort of different way of thinking and the ability and the desire to take risks. If you want to win, you've got to take risks. Now, how did he assess uh, his peers and his superiors? Um, well, first of all, with Eisenhower, what I found in volume two, and I, I bring it up about halfway through, there were two things you needed if you wanted Patton to respect you, a West Point diploma and World War I combat experience. If you didn't have one or the other, he'll insult you in some way. Um, who is it? General Twaddle of the, uh, 20, uh, the 95th Infantry Division, who does very well in and around Metz. Patton is constantly critical of him because he got his army commission from a college that wasn't West Point, and he never made it to World War I. So early on in North Africa and Sicily, Patton is critical of Eisenhower, but he would always kind of come back and say, but I don't know anyone else who could do a better job than him. Across the continent, that disappears. And he, you know, basically saying Eisenhower doesn't see what I see. He doesn't appreciate what I'm doing. He, he doesn't realize the things I'm realizing. And guess what? That happens in everywhere, corporate America, government, the military, when you're at the top of the pyramid, you see things the people below you aren't considering. And so Eisenhower has to calculate for all of this. And Patton's just seeing it kind of as his war and Eisenhower should be supporting that. Omar Bradley, uh, a high level of respect because I think he knows if he's disrespectful to Bradley, he's definitely going home because he already had that situation where Bradley was underneath him. And he's told everybody, I can work under Bradley. That's not gonna be a problem. In fact, one of Patton's staffers went to Bradley after his death, Pat Patton's death, and said, you know, when he was critical in the headquarters of other generals, he never badmouthed you. And, and he would write in his diary, his actual diary sometimes, you know, Bradley's a good general, just not great. You know, so, we, but they did get along very well at a time of real humiliation for Bradley. And that's when Eisenhower, which I feel was the right decision, took First Army away from him in the Battle of the Bulge, really because of communications problems. And so Bradley's down there in Luxembourg commanding one army, Patton's army. But everybody just looks to Patton for everything because he's the iconic name. But, you know, and Patton was very sensitive to that. He knew that that was humiliating to Bradley and went to him every day and told him what they were up to. And they would kind of joke around sometimes. Finally, Montgomery. Um, he outright resented Montgomery. But I don't think Montgomery really cared about Patton. You guys, like, there's a there's a poor comparison that's given a lot between Montgomery and Patton, and it's actually well highlighted in the movie um, A Bridge Too Far, where it starts off with a documentary format, and they said, Brad, you know, Montgomery wants to go through Holland, Patton wants to go through the Sarland. No, Montgomery wanted to go through Holland. Bradley wanted to go the other way. He's an army group commander. He's one level above, above Patton. He's not considering Patton. He's considering Omar Bradley. 
you know. Um, but yeah, the, it's outright resentment for Montgomery. He thinks he's slow when he is finally moving and sees him fighting stationary battles where Patton's fighting battles of maneuver. Did I leave anybody out? I think that was everybody, right? That's who I asked about. Okay, gotcha. Right. But it's interesting that the people you asked about were all army group or higher or commanders. Higher. Uh, yeah. And Patton is, sorry guys, just an army commander. Yeah. There are lots of them. And he's, he's uh, not heavily critical of uh, Hodges, nor no. Sandy Patch. You know, no. I mean, they rarely come up. Or Simpson. Yeah, or Simpson, you know. But he's the people he's dealing with, obviously, are Bradley really more than anybody else. And then he just hates Montgomery, you know, with every fiber of his existence. So, Kevin, why don't you tell us a little bit, one of the things that you point out in the book is that the size of his command is vastly different from volume one to volume two. So from... Nor that so what 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 is that difference and how does that impact his command style and his method of leadership? Sure. So um, in North Africa, he's a core commander, meaning he's only commanding two to three divisions. Um, when he gets to Sicily, they bump him up to army commander, uh, but it's really just one core and a few other divisions, and so he creates his own what's called a provisional core. Uh, to go up to Palermo while Bradley's Corps is fighting. So it's very ad hoc. And I think not just the size of the army, but the terrain he's fighting on really make a difference. Um, Sicily is really an infantryman's war, and Patton is just expiring himself, trying to make it look like a tank war to the point where he's preventing 3rd Infantry guys from going into Palermo. They have to pull back and let the tanks go in to make it look like a tank battle. And the 3rd ID guys are just furious about this. But when he gets to the continent of Europe, he's now in command of anywhere from three to even four divisions. At one point, he is down to two for a little bit. But these are very mechanized divisions. And the countryside of France in Normandy, all the way to the Moselle, uh, is pretty flat country. And so he's able to exploit it with armor and trucks. And, you know, and that was the great advantage of the American army over the British army and even the German we were so mechanized, you know, we, we had the deuce and a half trucks. There were so many Jeeps, you know, we just fleets and fleets of tanks. And it's really in France that we're able to really kind of flex our muscles and show what the American army can do. And Patton is the one doing the flexing. But, but at some point, you, you said three to four divisions. At some point, he, he gets up by the time of the Battle of the Bulge, the third army is like 13 divisions. Right. He's, he's in charge of four corps. You know, he's got his... At one point, he was down to two, just Walker, I think it's Walker and Eddie. Um, and then because he lost Middleton's, well, he gets Middleton back because Middleton's the one being attacked in Bastogne and he has to pull south of there. Um, and then they give him the third corps under a guy named Milliken, who's green to all of this. But he's in the perfect position to drive up to Bastogne and, and does a very competent job, I believe. I, I feel like Mil Milliken is one of those Milliken and... Um, Oh, who commands the fourth armored division? It's um, Grove? Jack Wood was replaced. Wood. Oh, Wood, right? Yeah, Jack Wood is replaced yeah. uh, because he kind of loses his temper at, at Eddie, and that's unacceptable. And Patton takes his chief of staff Gaffey and yeah. puts him in, in charge of fourth armor. And whenever you read really accounts of the fourth armor, they always say like, "Well, we we don't really get up to Bastogne because everything Jack Wood taught us." And so they tend to play him down. But he was the guy in command at the time and performed, I thought, admirably. So a lot of people should get a lot better credit in the Battle of the Bulge, and I tried to give them a little bit of a highlight to give them that in my book. One of the things that uh, just struck me reading your book is that Patton is very quick to threaten people with removal. I'm going to sure. pull you off. I'm going to take you down. You know, you, you'll be out of a job if you don't take that hill kind of stuff but he's actually pretty slow to actually remove people. He doesn't, he really is, you know, you have this sort of the impulsive nature of what comes out in his, you know, in the field moments, but then when he's actually confronted with these decisions, he is not very fast to remove people. No. Well, I would say with lower ranking people, yes, he is fast, especially when it involved the Red Ball Express. You know, this is the line of trucks driven mostly by African-American soldiers and, you know, he was tearing off sergeant stripes if someone was blocking a road or something for the Red Ball or if someone was blocking ambulances. Uh, you know, he's reducing colonels in grade immediately. But when it came to 
division commanders. I would say mostly division because they're he did think about giving Eddie a break at one point. But with his division commanders, you know, the core commanders would come up and say, I need to relieve this guy. And he's like, I don't know that we have anybody better. You know, he's, he's got the experience that we got to stick with this guy. And if things get really bad, then we will. And Wood is one of those people where Eddie says, you know, he's been insubordinate. And Eddie was afraid to approach Patton with this stuff because he knew Patton and Wood were good friends. Uh, Wood, of course, the commander of 4th Armored Division. And Patton and him knew each other back all the way to West Point. But to Patton's credit, he wrote a letter to Wood uh, to Woods and said, you know, hey, you really skirted the line here. I, I'm, I'm going to relieve you if you do this again. And that at least relieved Eddie that he goes, OK, you know, Patton, you know, he's not going to go against me in this situation. He's got my back. So when Woods really went insubordinate, yelled at his corps commander, which you never do in the military, it got reported and Patton pulled him. But on the whole, Patton really wanted to give people a second chance. He knew how stressful and hard combat is and how valuable experience is at the same time. So the 80th Division commander was almost pulled, the 35th. And really, the, the problems they had were fatigue. You know, these guys are fighting around the clock every day. They're getting exhausted. And the corps commanders want them fired. And he's like, no, they've got experience. And, you know, McBride and Bade, I think... Bade gets transferred out of Third Army right after the bulge, but they both fight their divisions all through the war, you know. And so I think Patton could see that. He knew that combat was exhausting and he shouldn't act rashly in that case. So one of the things, Kevin, I'd, I'd like you to kind of get into is um, the whole idea of air power and air support, because one of the thing, questions I get all the time on tour, I'm sure you've gotten it, um, Rick has gotten it, is, you know, the, well, why didn't they just bomb it? Uh, and, and, and most of our guests, and I think most people in general, really don't uh, understand how air power worked at that time. And, and I think what I've looked at is it's not really a, a very good story. I mean, Americans, they, don't, they have a hard time getting tactical air support. Sure. Sorted. Um, but, but Patton seems to do that. So how does yes. that? So I'm going to start with the good stuff and then we'll talk about, let's talk about what the Air Force, the, the, the Air Forces can do and kind of what they can't. Right. So, um, and a lot of this, the credit goes to Omar Bradley for this because um, Quesada, uh, General Quesada, uh, or Quesada goes to Bradley um, in late July and they're talking about the problem that they're having trouble communicating between the pilots and the men on the ground. There just is not well-coordinated air cover. Um, the idea of planes being in a tactical role is to bomb targets immediately behind the line. That's the idea of what a tactical role is, not frontline attacks. And the solution they come up with is to put Air Force or Army Air Force's radios inside tanks. And then the real brilliant idea is to take a pilot and put him in the tank. And that way, as they're rolling forward and they see a German roadblock, he's the one getting on the radio talking to his brothers and Pilots are thinking very differently from guys on the ground because they're traveling so fast. So these pilots on the ground know how to talk. You know, there's an, an obstacle up here. It's 40 you know, meters south of this barn and 20 meters north of this tree. And suddenly <coughs> there's this great communication and these fighter bombers can really blow up things on the front lines, no longer immediately behind. And there's just case after case where the tanks would roll up on an obstacle and instead of engaging... They would just roll off to the side, call in the air support. The planes would come down, strafe three or four times, knock out the roadblock. And then they would do barrel rolls over the tanks on the road and the guys would stand up and cheer. And this just works hand in glove. And the Germans really don't have an answer for it. And that's really what enables Patton to travel so quickly across France. Um, the negatives, well, first of all, you know, why does Patton stop? Uh, you know, yes, he, he runs out of fuel, but there's other elements. The terrain changes as he gets around the Meuse. Or they, they're starting really dealing with cliffs and forests much more than this farm country that they've gone through. And got to remember, Eisenhower's thinking strategically. He has got to gain access to the French ports, which I've sealed up basically under German troops. They're all turned into fortresses. And to crack open some of these, he takes an element of O.P. Weiland that that's uh, Patton's tactical air commander, takes a lot of the planes away and uses them to attack the, the stationary targets to crack them open. So Patton loses a big element of the tool that's been helping him out so much. Now, 
to the to the answer your question or the question we get why didn't they just bomb it you know a lot of those forts especially around Metz are built to resist air power and yes they did bomb it they bombed it over and over and over again these Fort Driant things like that just to no effect the defenses were too strong just like the U-boat pens you know and now there was another element to this that I just it just slipped my mind why aren't they bombing it um I talked about the, the they took away a lot of aircraft but it was just that oh I know what it was I, I came across this in the book because Patton when he failed to take Fort Driant the first time he went to Jimmy Doolittle and he says I want you to bomb well I'll put it differently bomb the snot out of that fort right. and he says okay and, and they refer to it as the revenge bombing because he's so mad that he couldn't take Driant well it gets sent up the line and the Air Force generals are like no we're not attacking a stationary target you know that that is in a wooded area we're, we're attacking what's moving and what's going on the railroads and everything we're not wasting a bomber attack for revenge we're going to only attack the targets that we know are of value um so it so something like that falls to the lowest rung of the priority ladder but it was just that you know and, and you both of you guys have been around those forts all over europe and just seen how thick the concrete is and everything and yeah, it's not, a, a, we didn't have laser guided missiles or anything no. back then. It wasn't the simple solution we think it is now. But why, well, why do you think it is that Third Army seems to be able to use air power more effectively than First Army? Ninth you know, Army? I don't have an answer for that. I don't know. You know, um, General Hodges was notorious for not keeping a diary and keeping a tight lip. Right. So I can't get inside his head. Now, I would say initially, He's fighting the bulk of German troops in the Normandy area while Patton's skirting around them. You know, Patton's really not meeting the kind of resistance that First Army is meeting. So I would imagine that's it. But I've just never really studied the air power under First Army. Yeah. I want to remind everybody that we are speaking today with Kevin Hemo, who is the author of Patton's War. This is volume two. Someone asked how many volumes there will be, and there will be three. Kevin, I know you're working on volume three right now. Um, yep. And uh, <clears throat> I want to uh, bring in a couple of the questions that we've had from people, uh, and we'll, we'll scroll back up to somebody who asked this question before the show even started. They said, two questions for Kevin. Did he think Patton really was reincarnated, and what was the deal with his affair with his niece? And so, Kevin, you can take those in either order you want to do so. <laughs> Yeah, I've never been asked these questions a million times. Um, so first one, re reincarnation. Um, you know, it's funny, he never used the word reincarnation. He would just talk about having been on these battlefields. And I think it really came from his highly in-depth reading of military history. But it's something he did as a child too, saying that he had been on these battlefields to his parents. But there was one odd case, because I can't really track it down. And this came from Charles Codman. Um, where they got to the Danube in 45 and he tells Codman, he goes, you know, I remember being here and walking across this shallow area of the Danube and there was this huge rock where we were marching and Napoleon was up there going, let's go, come on, move it. And Codman's like, you know, guys, crazy. And then the next day Codman drove down to the river and he saw this huge boulder, you know, right there. So, I don't know that he had been there before, um, but I think a lot of it came from the, the the history that he read that he would sort of place himself in. I know that that plays to that whole narrative of Patton the mystic and the guy that predicts the Battle of the Bulge. So I've, I've been able to knock down one of those pillars, uh, but that's the best I can say about that with reincarnation. Um, number two, Gene Gordon. So this is Patton's niece. Uh, they get together the first time in the 1930s in Hawaii when he's stationed out there. Uh, it's his niece on his wife's side, though, so it's okay. Um, <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, that, okay. that got a good laugh at the Library of Congress uh. last week. <laughs> um, so they, what was it? They were going to go to an island, the whole family, and buy some horses, and Patton's wife got sick. So Patton just took Jean, and that's where they supposedly commenced the relationship or consummated the relationship. Um, it goes on in Hawaii, then it ends, and then it's not until 1944 when Patton's in England that he sees her again. <clears throat> and there was a general on Eisenhower's staff, um, Everett Hughes, who kept a diary. And 
Patton came to him after he had hooked up with her in England and said, you know, she's been mine for 20 years or something like that. And then um, she becomes a donut dolly and she gets basically stationed at his headquarters all through Third Army's fighting in World War II. And of course, Patton doesn't write about this, but Beatrice finds out and she's writing very angry letters to him about it. And she says, you know, a lot of people are coming back from Europe saying, oh yeah, Patton has these really pretty wax, you know, women's auxiliary army corps women with him or women's army corps at that point. And Patton writes her back, he goes, I promise you, we don't have a single whack in my headquarters. And I don't have time for this. Gene Gordon was a donut dolly with the Red Cross. So Patton was able to legally skirt the issue. But I guess the big thing is, I've just seen too many eyewitness accounts talking about her being there. And in fact, Everett Hughes, who I mentioned earlier, uh, was at Patton's headquarters in Reims, France. And two days after the Battle of the Bulge explodes, He's standing outside and sees this plane circling down, and it's Patton's plane. He recognized it. So when the plane lands, he runs out to greet General Patton and off steps Gene Gordon. Patton was getting her out of the way for the combat that was to come. Now she does get back to Third Army headquarters in time for, I think, December 30th. Uh, there was some shelling that went on, and Gene, there was an eyewitness from one of the donut dollies that Gene called her uncle and he said, you know, hey, we'll move you to another headquarters or something so you're safe. And then I interviewed a veteran who, when the war ended, had a, he was able to get, um, during the Battle of the Bulge, he got a picture of Eisenhower and Patton standing together. I think they had just come out of the Verdun meeting. And he was able, Kay Summersby, he gave the picture to Kay Summersby and she got Eisenhower to sign it. And at the end of the war, he meets Gene Gordon, who says, well, give it to me. I'll have my uncle Patton sign it. And so she was around him through the entire war. That's and that's about as salacious as I can get because I they, nobody wrote about what went on. But you know, just a constant companion. Um, I'm, I'm going to add one quick anecdote. There's a very famous story that um, Marshall George C. Marshall, the chief of staff of the military, that Eisenhower said he was going to divorce his wife Mimi and marry Kay Summersby, his driver, and that George C. Marshall said, "If you ever do that, you'll never be president." Well, that story comes from Patton's doctor, a guy named Odom. And the pattern I realize that in Odom's book is every time Eisenhower denied Patton something, fuel, air support, something like that, Patton would complain about him having an affair with Kay Summersby, which is the pot calling the kettle black. And so I believe that that story is where that came from, just one of Patton's anger rages. I don't think it really happened. So, uh, Rick, now that you've asked the question, we get back to like the history part, the military history part. You, you know, there are other questions to ask, but please go <laughs> in and I'll, I'll intersperse them because well, at least one of us respects our audience's well, questions. Well, that's fair enough. You have a zing. Okay, fair enough. Bing. Uh, <laughs> we have to drink when that happens? Yeah. Oh, I uh, promised Connie Kennedy I'd do jazz hands every time I said that. Okay. Oh, uh, we should all do it. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things I, I would actually like you to elaborate, elaborate a bit on, Kevin, excuse me, is um, Patton's use of ultra intelligence, because you uh, oh. make some interesting observations there. And uh, his uh, his use of ultra and his appreciation of ultra, I think, is a little bit different than some of the other senior allied commanders. So kind of yeah. tell us a bit about that. He probably take the yeah, he probably takes advantage of Ultra. And we should say Ultra, as the British were able to crack the German codes uh, using a computer they called Ultra. And that's and they would basically send German communications directly to high commanders. I don't think it went anywhere below Army Command. It stayed at Army Command. Um, and, and I think that's, again, something that adds to the myth because Patton takes this so seriously. He has his morning staff meeting. Then he has a private meeting every day with his ultra translators and he takes what they give him so seriously he makes small maps and draws on the maps you know what the germans are up to and it, it really freaks out the ultra guys because they're like sir if this map falls into enemy hands he's like don't worry i'll bring it back to you every night but he's able to go to his core commanders and say you know beef up defenses here the germans are probably going to attack around 9 30. you know and they're like wow how does he know this stuff um and, and wisely does not lead on how he knows it um but you know, it's something that he, if it, if Ultra was an orange, he squeezed it till every pip screamed. Ooh, you know, he used every ounce of it. And, you know, again, 
this is something that's going to lead to the Battle of the Bulge because Hitler is so paranoid. He doesn't allow any information about the upcoming Ardennes offensive to go out over the airwaves. It's all telephone, ground communication, wire communication. And so that over-reliance on Ultra leads to Patton and all the other high commanders having a blind eye to what's really developing across from them. But yes, yeah, something that he uses to the, an extent more than, from what I've seen, other commanders. Yeah. I could be wrong. Maybe they were doing it too, but I no, no, you know, you know, obviously uh, Montgomery has almost complete disdain for it. He sure does. Yep. Um, and I'm just thinking of some of the others. And so you, you know, you do highlight the fact that he does actually use it as a valuable tool. Yep. Definitely. So Kevin, uh, uh, I want to thank you for incorporating the story of the ghost army <laughs> into your book. <laughs> Did you do that deliberately? You Did you do that to you? ensure you would get invited up? Uh, because yeah. it worked. You're dang right. <laughs> and, and I'll put this one so you'll have me on next time. I didn't go to the library and get it. I bought a copy. Woo! Wow. All, right. All right. All right. Yeah, I'm That's done. diplomacy, Bye. gentlemen. I have a <laughs> <laughs> this is out of here. <laughs> so the 23rd conducted a number of deceptions for Patton's Third Army. And there's a quote, which is not in your book, but it's from a deception planner named Colonel Billy Harris, who said about George Patton when he was asked about him. Um, he was the greatest team player that we ran into over there. He would do anything you asked him to in the interest of the overall picture. And this is a very different um, kind of I picture of Patton than you that. usually get. And when I present this quote at talks, uh, I always say that this demonstrates Patton's genius as a commander, his willingness to do anything to win. And, you know, he understood deception could help him, so he embraced it. But I wonder what your take is on this. Well, Rick, I tell you, um, yeah. And any praise, you know, you want to throw in for the, the book is good because there's a new edition coming out in October. Well, I, I can tell you this, and maybe you saw this in the book. There were times when he said, we ordered these guys to wear different patches on the front line to trick the Germans and stuff. And I wondered if that was your unit, the Ghost Army doing that. But in, so as not to reveal the Ghost Army, he's saying, you know, we told them to do this and that. So I think there might have been more activity of the ghost army than even revealed in my book. Stop, Kevin. Just stop right now. <laughs> Go on, Kevin. Okay, let me put it this way. Let me get Chris back on my side. And some of the best soldiers, I think, played for the Boston Red Sox. All right. So, <laughs> okay. All right. Woo, okay. Ted Williams, we'll get it in there. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but no, that, I will say, Rick, like many a book, your book helped to flesh out Patton and give that microscope view of him that I was really going for. So, uh, thank you. <laughs> Wasn't really fishing for the comment, but we'll take it. <laughs> you weren't really. <laughs> you were holding your breath till we got uh, to this point. Yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah, that's the clip I'm using for the promo. All right, <laughs> All right Chris, go ahead. No, no, so-, so That's hard to follow up, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, I, I have nowhere to go with that. Um, um, Chris, yeah. I think I used your Osprey book for something too. I just can't remember what it was. Oh, like to probably to prop up your typewriter when you were- Whoa. <laughs> Okay. Um, so what did, obviously you spent, in my opinion, probably far too much time with George Patton. I'd go mad, but you spent a considerable amount of time with George and you've uncovered some things particularly interesting about his diary. Yeah. Um, so one of the questions we had earlier, and I'm not going to scroll up because I can't probably find it right now, but Nancy Nylance asked, how do you correct the historical record based on what you've sort of uncovered and, and can you, or do you? And what do you do? I mean, I know you're, the focus of your book, obviously, is patent on leadership and patent on the battlefield, but you have kind of dropped a bombshell here. Yep. So, um, so what, is it what, do, what do we do with this? Do we, uh, can, How can does the, the official record, record get corrected? So, yeah. okay, let's, let's talk reality here. First of all, you write a book, which I did, and then we're all realists. You sit back and you wait for Steven Spielberg to call. Okay, cool. <laughs> and when he says, I want to make a mini series out of your Problem book, solved. You say, let's get cracking. Um, because let's face it, you know, how many how many people know about Dick Winters, an obscure right. company commander? You know, it's not from official records, but you know, there is a, who is it? Um, the, who's the British captain? He wrote uh, Patton at Bay, and uh, um, he's oh, written several Whiting? books about Patton. Hmm? Was it Whiting? Pritchard. Pritchard. Yeah, um, I think that I'm, I'm probably mispronouncing his name, but he took, I found, uh, what was it, uh, who's, uh, Allen, 
Um, uh, Henry Allen, I think on Patton's staff had written a diary. Uh, and then he later wrote the book Drive about, or Lucky Forward. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, so that diary was in the uh, the Patton Museum at Fort Knox. Now it's probably at Fort Benning. Um, and I found it and was using big excerpts from it to write the book. And of course, I've been researching this for like 20 years. Well, I told a guy named Roger Cirillo about this. And he yeah. said, you know, would you be willing to make those diaries into a book? I said, I'm, I'm too busy with my own stuff. So this captain did that. He turned it into a book. So, you know, there you've got a corrected record. Um, but I'll leave it to another historian who wants. To, and it, it really wouldn't take that much effort because the Library of Congress has already done the heavy lifting of transcribing those diaries word for word. Now, I'll tell you the tough part, as I'm working on volume three, Patton's diaries only go up to the end of March of 44. April and May are missing. We're, no, I shouldn't say that. April and May were not submitted to the Library of Congress. So I am trying to find, if it exists, that diary. And my worry is April and May is when they're finding all the concentration camps. Right. And I'm definitely afraid of Patton's anti-Semitism bubbling over. And I think that's why we don't know where they are. And all we have are these enhanced, you know, transcribed diaries. But, you know, that's a big goal of mine is trying to find these diaries if they exist. So, you know, the only way you can correct the record is to write. Uh, for the longest time, there was the embellished, and this is in the introduction, or the foreword that Peter Caddick Adams was kind enough to write for my book. I mean, you look at someone like Custer, right. you know, the, 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 his wife embellished his record incredibly. And, you know, I've talked, I think, with you guys about this before. After every war, all the generals write their memoirs good to cover their butts and look good. And then the sort of next generation that writes are the descendants of those people that fought. So they tend to be very fawning and, and hero, you know, stuff, what it would call the greatest generation. And then I think we're now at that third part where the historian, the class, the, the records are being declassified. Objective historians are getting in there and saying, oh, wait, this is what's really happened. So I think that's just something that's almost a cycle that follows every major war. And so I think we're finding that out right now with Patton. So at least for, at least from this point on, people don't have an excuse like, well, I didn't know that he didn't predict the Battle of the Bulge. Like, no, it's there and easy to find. It's been published. So that's so my one, one, one more on the on the diary and then, and then we'll quit. But uh, this is from uh, Frank Cook. And so he says, is it possible that the revisions by his former aides were based on conversations they had with Patton at the time, thus their rationale for editing them in? That's entirely possible. There's just no way to prove it or disprove it. So, yeah, he might have a point. Like I said, it looks like a lot of score settling. And so maybe they want to settle it for their general, who they adored. You know, and oh, he told me this one time, so I'll put it in the diary. You know, but we don't know that. And so, yeah. therefore, we have to go with what we know he wrote in his own handwriting. You know, and he didn't predict the Battle of the Bulge. So, so... You know, obviously, you've spent a lot of time with him, as I, you know, we've talked about. Um, is there anything in the process of doing this um, that's kind of revised your opinion of Patton? I mean, did you, I don't want to say discover anything new, because we've talked about, obviously, the diary, sure. but something new about his personality that you didn't realize before, as you're, you know, how, how is... I guess there wasn't anything, well, you know, there was the racism and the anti-Semitism. Yeah, but you had a sense of that, though, right? Yeah, but to see the N-word in the diaries was like, ooh, you know. Yeah. And then, you know, of course, that's been sanitized when you look at the typed up ones. But I think it's like with any professional historian that, you know, people always say like, wow, you really love Pat. And I'm like, no, I loved him when I was a kid. And then I've studied him seriously. And I realized he has his strong points and his weak points. He's a human being. And, and so that's really what it is. It's not really learning an, a, 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 a character trait that I never saw before. It's more the, of course, he made a mistake here. Of course, he didn't see this. You know, he is a human being. So I think that was the realization. I guess his anxiety of being relieved was probably driven home more to me. That even in his most successful moments, he's like, man, if I screw this up tomorrow, it's, you know, I may have done good things today, but if I screw up tomorrow, I could be sent home. He knew that despite all of his achievements, he was not above being let let go like just everybody else, which is not uncommon in the military. Right. You know, they, they rotate people in and out all the time. And so I guess that 
baseline anxiety. Uh, you see it a lot in Sicily before the slapping incidents. Mm. You know, there's that tragic friendly fire incident with the 82nd Airborne in the U.S. Navy. Right. And Eisenhower is livid about this. And, you know, and Patton goes, I might be the scapegoat. You know, I'm the guy in command. I told them I, I rescinded the order too late. And if anybody's at fault, it's me. And it terrified him. So I guess that was the, the very human elements of him were refreshing to learn about. Kevin, one last question for you. You paint a picture of Patton being at the center of some of the most important battles fought in Europe. We barely even talked about the Battle of the Bulge, we barely talked about the Lorraine campaign, uh, the destructions of the German at Falaise. We did talk about the race across France. Take Patton away. He's killed by a stray artillery shell in July or his plane crashes. How is the war different? It could take us, now Chris is going to get mad at this. I, I think it would have, could have, it could have taken us to 1946 to end that war. Well, you got the bombs, the atomic bombs already, so maybe not that, at least till August, August 7th to be precise. Um, I think it would have taken longer to win the war if Patton had not been involved. Um, there's a famous, well, maybe it's not even famous, but uh, I've talked about it before. It'll be in volume three, that uh, several rabbis at Patton's funeral went up to his casket and said a prayer. And a reporter was nearby and he said, what are you guys doing? The guy was one of the most famous anti-Semites in the U.S. Army. And, the, and by the way, the rabbis were dressed in their concentration camp uniforms and the striped uniforms. And one of the rabbis says, yes, we know that about Patton, but we believe that because of his generalship, the war ended earlier than it would have ended and he saved thousands of Jewish lives. So I think it was well known at the time, uh, as well as what I'm seeing in my research, that Patton would have ended the war earlier. Without Patton, the war would have gone on for a few more months and killed that many more thousands of people. Well, on that note, Kevin Hemel, thank you so much for joining us today to talk about your recent book, uh, Patton's War, Volume 2, An American General's Combat Leadership, covering George Patton's time in uh, Europe from August 1 to December 31st, 1944. We really appreciate you spending time with us today. We do, Kevin. And by the way, are, are, are you going to talk about Hamelberg in Volume 3? Sure. Oh, oh the good. Hamelberg Raid? you oh, got good. to mention that. Yeah, the good and the bad. In good fact, volume, yeah. volume 3. <laughs> Chris wanted to make sure that, that Patton would be dead by the end of Volume 3. And so we've confirmed that, right? <laughs> so i gotta, I got to give a shout out to my friends at the Minnesota Historical Society. They've got interviews with several people that were part of the raid. Now, remember, I'm telling it from the patent perspective, not from theirs, but they've given me a lot of real good firsthand accounts. So I can't wait to dig into that one. And okay. I'm sure you'll be dealing with the um, the murder of General Patton. I will have a chapter on the car accident that killed him, yes, and all the crazy conspiracies that followed. You know, on my tour, we go to the car accident site. Um, and so that's how we kind of end the whole tour. Yeah, with Kevin, the, I'm trying to help you sell books. Like, yes, I'm going to finally deal with you know, the controversy yeah. in volume three. <laughs> Kevin Hemel, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks, Kevin. Chris, thanks for reading the book. Rick, thanks for reading the book. But I know it was tougher for one of you. <laughs> <laughs> I did it, though. I sold it. Uh, okay, <laughs> cheers. Thank you so much. Thanks, and I, I know which one of us it was tougher for. Uh, <laughs> And uh, yeah, but volume three, we can we can we can bring it back, you know, and maybe if we're still doing history well, happy hour. We have to talk to Kevin because, you know, if he kills off Patton at volume three, he'll never get the hat. And like Belkowski, he's got like he's got like books in the bank. So well, he he's does have Kevin of, does have other books he wants to work on. So okay. if we go long enough, we, we might right. get the hat. And, we, and we've really we haven't invited Belkowski. You know, he's on that cusp. And we yeah. have failed to bring him back. You've, been, you've just been teasing him. You've been dangling it like a carrot. Maybe we should. I know we have a date coming up, uh, a free date in September. Maybe we should see if he's free that day. So. Uh, uh, next week, we have an encore episode. And um, I've been on vacation, so I haven't selected it yet. So I don't know what it is. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah. 
it's something that we've done. It's a great show and a great topic, Chris, that we really enjoyed, and we're going to be presenting it again. Uh, and then after that, we have—I know we've been ping-ponging live and and uh, not live, but we have two mostly live, mostly ponging, but yeah, ponging. Okay. We have two live episodes in a row after next week. Uh, uh, meet at Gettysburg: A Study in Command with uh, yes. Kent Masterson Brown, and A Village in the Third Reich: How Ordinary Lives Were Transformed by the Rise of Fascism by Julie Boyd, and that show. The Village in the Third Reich show. We're going to do something that we have never done on History Happy Hour before. What's that, Rick? Well, I'm going to leave it alone for now. Ooh, that's well, maybe, like that uh, tease. Yeah, yeah it's, but a it's, tease. it's also it's also a really outstanding book. So awesome. Yeah. So um, listen, please subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook. Shout at us on Twitter. Listen to our podcast. Back us on Patreon. And browse HistoryHappyHour.com. We have. 150 episodes there check them out uh, crazy yep. check yep. them out all right thanks everybody be safe